We're going to bring in a brilliant economist who's going to sit down with the Ministry of Finance. He's going to explain how agricultural subsidies were removed in Egypt. And by doing so, we're going to unlock economic growth in Tanzania. <laughs> well, uh, hello, I'm Bean. Hello, and welcome to Mandatory Redistribution Party. My name is Sean Morley. And my name is Jack Lewis Evans. Today's pod ep is about heroes, villains, idols, and wastrels. And how all four of those things are in some way preordained on the atomic level in ways a demon could use to predict the future. It's a classic ep. We also talk about Mr Beans, the notoriously selfish London mute, and their potential extraterrestrial origins. Did you say beans? Z. Wow. Did you say beans? I don't think so. We'd like to take this opportunity to thank listeners who support our work at patreon.com forward slash mandatory redistribution party. Thank you. We hope you enjoy the additional content we supply on that platform. And thank you also to all those who dole out praise on the timeline. Your blessings will bring new ears to our little nook, and we are incredibly grateful. <laughs> Sean, uh, talking about heroes, do you know who my hero is? No. It's you. My friend, Sean Morley. <laughs> who's, who's, who's yours? Who's yours? Mr. Beans. You're saying beans. You're saying no. beans. No, I'm, no, I'm not. I'm just calling him, no, I'm saying, bean. calling him Mr. Beans. Yeah, Mr. Beans. If there's many of Mr. Bean, there are huh? Mr. Beans. What? But if there is a Mr. Bean... I'm, we're saying the same thing, Mr. Beans. No, no, you're saying beans. I'm not talking wrong. You're listening wrong. Listen to my lip. Mr. Beans. Sorry, your hero is Mr. Bean. Mr. Beans. I am a real strong believer in mm. don't meet your heroes and don't okay. become friends with them. Okay. If there's someone in my life mm. that I, it's almost like I use and I draw on them, mm. right? Everyone has got to have inspirations. Mm. But if they just become your friends and you're like, oh, you're a person, what's the fucking mm. point then? Mm. <laughs> They have fallen from Olympus. I wanted you to be an idea in my head. And now yeah. your flesh, I, you have a smell. I actually think that the biggest brain thing is that you need, like, obvi- I think what I'm doing is child brain. And a bigger yeah, brain yeah. is, is to not really have heroes in the first place. Let me explain what you ought to do as a, as a replacement to that. Okay, the pro strap. If, if someone has done a good thing, mm. you just draw inspiration from the thing. Mm. But as a culture, we don't do that, right? We look at the person who performed the action and we, like, deify <laughs> yes. them. Yeah, and we yeah, go, yeah, yeah. They, there must be something special about them, that these were some wonderful songs. Maybe we should biographize this artist mm. to pieces and turn them, only them with their special... It's almost like the Tolkien fantasy mm. of someone must have been a blessed chosen one. for, <laughs> And we must find out at what point <laughs> yeah. one of the goddesses came down and touched their forehead. Yeah, But it's not just... People, I start to think that arts are a lot more like science Mm. in that everyone's standing on the shoulders of giants. There are minor breakthroughs. Some of them are lucky accidents, like the Mm. chicken that ate the... I don't know what the chicken ate, but it created penicillin. It was a a lucky... (laughs) I don't remember what the chicken ate, but it was chicken ate so they shouldn't have eaten. Uh, And that's penicillin, baby. Yeah. When we create these creative breakthroughs, it's a mixture of accidents, Mm -hmm. intuition, happenstance. It's an alchemical reaction to the situation all its elements it's not because of some special or terrorist quality that we need to venerate someone for so never have any heroes realize (laughs) that everyone is flesh take them in smell them to their fullest if you can 
even detach them from the things you like about them. Who's the worst person that you've encountered in stand-up that like you maybe looked up at or were influenced by and then after encountering them you're like nah oh so like it was just by meeting them and seeing them in real life all of the sheen took off by the time i was meeting comedians famous enough to have been an influence on me when i started Mm. i was so jaded (laughs) (laughs) that i didn't look up to any one of that generation (laughs) Yeah, you'd seen their Twitter output. Yeah, I think they'd all done it to themselves with their yeah. own public uh, with their own public output <laughs> as an extension of their fame. You didn't need to meet them because you'd seen you'd had the effect you that is bad from meeting your heroes by seeing their social media output, which is a close approximation of the same experience. Yeah, following Armando Iannucci on Twitter yeah. is enough to just put me off yeah. everything that inspired yeah. me to take an interest in comedy. Yeah. I think it's really important that Chris Morris puts almost nothing out. And I want him to put nothing out. If you put something out, yeah. I'd oh, look don't at put it. anything. If you are listening, which you're definitely not, Chris Morris, don't say anything. Yeah, we Stay on treasure Olympus. your privacy. Yeah. <laughs> We want to invent the opposite of the Barbara Streisand effect, where we can say, stay away and no one look. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know when, like, when Wint Drill mm. got docs, everyone voluntarily just didn't care or look into it? And I think like, we initially framed this conversation in talking about how we guard ourselves against disappointment because mm. all your heroes turn out to be, at the lowest end, mm. just a normal person of no greater significance or with no greater expanded capacity than mm-hmm. you, mm-hmm. a lowly flesh walker. Mm. But obviously at its greatest, you learn that they are an evil, evil part yeah. <laughs> of a set of evil systems, which not only perpetuate evil <laughs> actions, but completely protect them from consequence. Yeah. yeah, that's really bad. And that's really bad and also incredibly relevant to comedy mm-hmm. and as well, every other industry on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> the structure agency thing, right? The agency putting primacy on the individual and the choices they make, the structure mm. being the situation. You know, and there's an interrelation between those two things, like structure and agency all the time of like, you know, well, let's think of the various factors that made like King successful. The giant movement of like thousands, millions of other people and all these other organisers that aren't as... <laughs> that aren't put on school history curriculums like uh, Ella Baker or whatever, but also things like for that type of nonviolence to work, you needed a, a sympathetic viewer and the technology to convey that through newspapers or video or whatever. And then you also needed um, a United States own propaganda effort that was saying, Do you know what? The Nazis are bad. Why are they bad? Because they are, they are against freedom. They are against democracy. They are racist. And then, So actually, when people come back after the war, they go, hold on, aren't we doing some of those things badly? Mm. So you have a knock-on effect on World War II propaganda. And then also the international pressure of the Cold War on Washington, D.C. politicians because it was, you know, basically bad PR internationally to have Jim Crow laws and to have uh, black foreign dignitaries come to Washington, D.C. and experience racism there's all this structure stuff going on which doesn't negate totally personal achievements of someone like king but it it has to contextualize them and what you gain from elevating king to like some fucking guy out of the marvel cinematic universe what how does that help you do more things oh it doesn't help help, (laughs) it doesn't help the black civil rights movement at all it allows you to you pick a guy who later can be destroyed first physically <laughs> yeah. by the CIA yeah. and yes, then later yes. metaphorically yeah, by right. becoming like Martin Luther King Day, which is just something yeah. that you get a special kind of coffee at Starbucks. It's yeah. completely like disentangled from him. Whereas if a black civil rights was just the black civil rights movement, no identifiable leadership, mm. you can't assassinate it. <laughs> and two, you can't reappropriate it as easily mm. into being a corporate holiday. You can't get a special black civil rights protest movement for political equality special keychain. (laughs) (laughs) It it can't become devoid of meaning, but a person can easily become devoid of meaning. Che Guevara t-shirts when we were growing up, nothing. Who's that? He's just a t-shirt man. There's there's like billboards up right now for Premier League restarting. um, And it has like Marcus Rashford taking the knee 
it says something like the fight goes on <laughs> but it's it's just a football advert Fight goes on. Subscribe to Sky Sports. <laughs> <laughs> you want to abolish the police? Get our live sports package. <laughs> yeah, it's totally fucked. But I think I think there is like another whole extra insidious layer to the veneration of people, mm. especially when like when we talk about things like decolonizing curriculums. Mm. It's that there is too much emphasis on like how could you not teach. Plato, who invented thinking. How could you not teach all these white Western Europeans? The canon. They, they came up with the thing, and we rely on the thing as a foundational part of teaching science, history, mathematics. Whatever you can think of, you can pin it back to someone in white Europe mm -hmm. who came up with it, because that's what's already like laser-focused in on by the people who established these curriculums in the first place. And it gets caught up in venerating the person, right? We name these things after the person. So you can't even teach the concepts decoupled from the person. Mm. We ought to biographicalize their ideas as though, like, how they come up with it was as is important as the thing itself. Yeah. So instead of like historical materials and people say Marxism. Mm, for example. Exactly. <laughs> it's, well, it happens all over the left, I think. I yeah. think there's a, there's a modern trend of not doing that. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. we're still wrapped up in like the thinker is the thought, and then when the thinker turns out to be bad, yeah. or hold have on, did any you criticism, did you guy knows that uh, Engels was actually a factory owner? Uh -oh. Get owned. Time to give all of the money back to the bosses. <laughs> <laughs> Egg on our face, and also dragging the whole, your communist manifesto PDF to the recycle bin. Everyone talking about Corbyn still, as though that affects anything to do with the left. <laughs> Everyone's going, oh, what, about, what about kinder, yeah. gentler politics? I've literally never said that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've never said that. And I've genuinely, if I could be honest, never, never believed in doing that. I've never signed up to that. <laughs> My slogan will be politics that flicks the Vs. <laughs> My slogan, I'm not going to say. <laughs> <laughs> If you want Jack's slogan, you'll have to wiretap our phones. <laughs> <laughs> Veneration of individuals. Very bad, I think. But it's hard not to do it. It's hard not to see someone seeming like they're doing anything special. And I tell you, the other place where venerating individuals uh, happens is that so many of people on the left are made into martyrs mm. in some way or another. Whether they are like just someone who's just been destroyed or they are just literally martyred, mm. they're just literally mm. killed. And you think, ah, uh, I don't want you to just vanish into an unnamed grave because you you paid a big sacrifice. Mm. And then we end up like connecting to individuals rather than necessarily the abstraction of a cause. Mm. I never gave a shit about Corbyn, but no. he's like given up so much peace of mind and he got so he received so much shit. He was like a lightning rod for shit. And I feel bad for the guy, whereas I'd rather not feel anything. <laughs> Yeah. He was just a guy who liked jam. He's still around. Is he? <laughs> <laughs> Muting Corbyn in your in your tweets, not just for self care, but because you want to convince yourself that he died in twenty nineteen. He didn't die. It's like at the end of Mr. Bean where he just goes back up. Goes back up. Do you know what Mr. Bean at the beginning of Mr. Bean? Yeah. He comes down the down. beam of light. Right. And I think in season two they introduced that at the end he just goes back goes up. Back up, right, okay. Just goes back into the holding pen. To Avalon until Britain yeah, I needs thought him I was again. Like, I was, yeah, I remember being confused whether that was some like UFO thing going on with that. Mr. Bean is canonically an alien. It actually says on IMDb, which I find it highly contentious, IMDb lists Mr. Bean as an alien. It's, sorry, is this real? Yeah, IMDb TV series, 1990 to 1995, um, Mr. Bean, portrayed by Sir Rowan Sebastian Atkinson, mm. is a lazy, crazy, clumsy, mischievous and destructive lunatic alien man from outer space. Alien? Alien man from outer space. Yeah, Mr. Bean's an alien. And who's written that? Richard Curtis? Uh, is, is this... It's IMDb, so I don't know. Who writes IMDb? I don't know. Is it like Wikipedia? <laughs> Hold on. Who oh, writes? Anyone can edit. I, I can edit it right now. Well, that's bullshit then, isn't it? Can you edit know, it? Because... Put, it's not an alien. Put citation needed. Can you citation needed it? Can you put that in? You could write fucking anything I... on there. You could write that Leonardo DiCaprio, the actual actor, is an alien. Hang on, I just need to agree to the conditions of use. No, this is too complicated. You could say <laughs> that Angelina Jolie is like a locust. Well, you can't... I 
I don't think you can. I don't think you can just change people's species. Well, someone, has. someone said that Mr. Bean's an alien. And that's true. It's supported by the text. Only the him getting beamed. Oh, yeah. And who else? Who, get be- who gets beamed? He could be getting Tell abducted. Tell me in line. He, he, he could be getting abducted by aliens and they do fucked up. They probe him, Mr. Bean, messing with his mind and all of his bean antics. We're laughing. <laughs> That's actually trauma response. Have you heard of Occam's razor? <laughs> I don't think it applies. <laughs> Occam's razor would say that he's just a weird guy as well. No, because the weird guy doesn't account for the beam. The beam is the title sequence. We cannot take the title sequence as canon to the happenings of the narrative. Why? Where's that rule come from? Well, you're struggling now. You're struggling a simple question and now you can't deal with it. Well, well, you can't have the start of a bloody... So you're saying that the start of the fucking Simpsons, that that happens, that canonically happens at the start of each show. No. That makes doesn't I make think, sense. I think it might be out of sequence, but everything there happened. What, isn't it the same start and end, though? Isn't it like a recycled... Yeah, he goes what? to the same point. Probably that's the pick-up, drop-up point from the alien craft. And where's that? And where's that? Just a street in central London. Listen, you can probably skip back in the recording. I want to believe, different show, but I, I want to believe Bean is an alien, an extraterrestrial being. Does it doesn't look like it. Oh, no! Listen, I'm just being self-critical here. Have we got actual evidence beyond... That's what I thought was... That's what I assumed was happening. But I didn't know that this was something that was concrete. It's on IMDb. I can look it up. Again, I can Google it. you're looping back. you got your one source and you're looping back. Atkinson has acknowledged that Mr. Bean has an alien aspect to him. Aspect? Alien can just mean strange, weird, other. Well, I- it doesn't even mean fucking xenomorph. Like, if you cut Mr. Bean, he, his blood will go through multiple floors because it's so acidic. Mr. Bean is confirmed as an alien. Confirmed? In tr- Listen to me now, my friend. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, 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 go, go, go on. Mr. Bean is confirmed as an alien in Double Trouble, the last episode of Mr. Bean, the animated series. The episode there is a UFO full of Mr. Bean's clones, people that look just like Mr. Bean, who have been dropped down onto the planet Earth many years ago and have now reunited with him. And they have now come to take him home. Mr. Bean is confirmed an alien. And the last episode of Mr. Bean, the animated series. And the Mr. Bean, the animated series is canon to the live action. It's the same guy. It's just it's just a, a depicted in a different way. It's it's the same story because he has the he's the same girlfriend. Wow. The same girlfriend crosses over between the two series. Yeah, same guy. Mister Bean's an alien. What is his civilization? Because to me, it seems like it could be a civilization of beans, or because Predator visits Earth to hunt mm. for sport. So maybe Bean's doing that. Like Bean comes to do a kind of sort of antics to report back to his people to see how much people will tolerate his zany antics. Or is being like a creation, like the alien, the xenomorph, that is like this sort of dangerous, unfathomable thing, but is like kind of spread across the galaxy. Do you think there could be something that's created Bean? I would say that Bean is probably a pupil stage mm. of an organ in an organism's life cycle, and they probably pop it on Earth as a kind of hatchery. Mm. And once it's ready to go back, they just pick it up, and then it can grow into its next stage of life. And you know what? This scans because Bean is a seed. It's a, a seed is a of seed. what is to come. Wow. So they, actually, it was at conception that they probably came up with this. So actually, you know, at the beginning of Mr. Bean, there's kind of a Latin choir, right? In the original 1990 mm. to 1995 mm. series. What they're singing in Latin is something like, here is a man who is a bean. <sighs> so he's confirmed to be a bean. And oh, a bean, as we know, God. is a seed. So a bean has, a seed has been planted on earth. And what will it grow into? I don't want to fucking know. The 2012 Olympic opening ceremony. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. Is Blackadder an alien? I mean, I can look it up. <laughs> are we just assuming all of Rodex's characters are aliens? Could be a shared universe. There's literally no Google results for that. <laughs> I, I haven't had a zero result in a very long time. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? That's not a no. <laughs> it's not a no. <laughs> it's a no it's result. Not a no. 
who's to say whether a sentence you've strung together for the first time in human <laughs> civilization isn't false? It's black adder and alien. Literally, no one's ever written that. <laughs> do you think, on the total flip side of this, do you think you could meet someone that is not a hero, but is in fact an enemy, and then come to know them, and thereby like end up liking them? Have you ever had a full one eighty reversal on an enemy to friend? But do you think if you could meet like an an orc? Oh, okay. So we're not talking like a political enemy or anything. We're talking about a, what a fully malevolent, corrupted elf. <laughs> Whether we could become friends. You pitch I mean, in the or, movie or Bright enemy. to me. <laughs> <laughs> if I know an orc is designed to be evil, mm-hmm. then I'd I'd make accommodations for that. Mm. Because if you're evil because someone has built you to be evil, mm. that feels like I've got to um cut you some slack. Mm. But when someone's built to be normal <laughs> and then they are evil, I think there's no need for that. <laughs> You've got no excuse. <laughs> mm. I think that's one of the weird the weird things about Lord of the Rings is that the orcs just making a big evil race. And also, you know, you can do it, you do it with like big evil race or big evil uh, robots. And then you can just ma- you make all of the violence of the protagonist characters just totally fine because you just go, well, these people, they're, they're evil. They're not like conscripts in an army or people who've had just different experiences from you and therefore are in a kind of different situation and structural causes have made you kill them and it's actually more complicated. They yeah. just go, no, no, they're just, they're just pure evil. And then no one has to have PTSD. You don't have to have another fucking 40 minutes of Return of the King where everyone's like, guys, I think that. that was fucked, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Could we have used our words? Um. <laughs> <laughs> Did we actually ever stop to try and talk to these people? Gandalf should have asked the Balrog if they were okay. Yeah, are you okay? You Is okay, there mate? something happening at home? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, rewrite Lord of the Rings, but Gandalf's like a social worker, like the yeah, first ever social worker on Middle yeah. Earth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are there people in your life you can talk to? <laughs> <laughs> sure, it's really important to reach out. And I want you to know yeah, that even you you're clearly going sure. through something now. You can, I will listen. I'm here for you. It doesn't make you, you know, it doesn't make you weak to need to reach. Out. It actually makes you strong, right? Because you're dealing with so much right now. It actually means you're really strong because you keep going. You're a fighter. <laughs> but you can't be evil if you don't have any choice right you can't be evil if you're yeah, just programmed you're just... evil you can't be evil if you're a robot and someone goes do evil things what, what we mean is yeah, yeah, yeah. they're violent but then all uh, enemy yeah. combatants in a war are violent, are violent. so yeah 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 otherwise you're just killing civilians <laughs> 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 all our enemy combatants won't fight and they seem to just be wanting to live in their house and trade this is our perfect chance to strike <laughs> <laughs> go 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 <laughs> Go, go, go. There's a a massive opportunity here. (laughs) We're going to smash this. Yeah. They're evil and asleep. (laughs) Oh, my God. Life hack. (laughs) What life hack? Attack pacifists. I believe that hack has actually been tried many times. (laughs) <laughs> so yeah what's your, what would you do you're hanging out with an orc well uh, what's your wanting to do wants to smash skulls and yeah, fight yeah. and wants to start eat, yeah. fires wants to, to kill you. me wants to do, it, kill and devour you it's like I'm hanging out with like a sentient bear <laughs> a bear for the most part doesn't want to be near me and would uh-huh. rather I was just flesh not that yeah right yeah, yeah. Not not there, just I need my divine connection from God severed with tooth and mm-hmm. fang. Mm-hmm. And it can do that as only a mild inconvenience to its day. Yeah. Um, and uh, I don't think I could befriend something that would murder me only because I'm mm-hmm. an inconvenience. Mm-hmm. So probably a resounding no. But I wouldn't blame the orc. But I would blame... <laughs> Like a a human or a friend or a shopkeeper. Yeah. yeah. So what about what about um, you know what about a Tory? You know all the people. It's 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 we're, we're approaching the start of semester one of university, so we will soon get the articles about Tories moving into halls and going. Mm. All the people in my halls <laughs> hate me <laughs> just because I hate the poor. It reminds me of like. The children of the most evil people on mm-hmm. earth, right? Like, mm-hmm. like when people are saying, don't make fun of Jacob Rees Mogg's children. And it's like, those children are going to grow up to kill yeah. my dad. Yeah. Why do or you like, think they're going to. Don't make fun of what? Baron Trump. Well, I think it's because there's a cutoff, right? In yeah. the same way that you can't send a child to prison, uh-huh. th- that, that sort of moral principle is extended to, like, you can't mock a child because mm-hmm. it hasn't done it yet. 
It will. <laughs> it's on a 100% trajectory to cause <laughs> to sin against God and humanity, but it hasn't done it yet. So give it a little while before you respond with your one counterattack to being socially murdered, which is teasing. <laughs> In the same way that an orc is built to be evil and a robot could be programmed to be evil, what what is the distinction between these children that are going to be programmed to be evil? Yeah. And then the next step is, well, what's the difference between these children and the adults they're going to become? It's just time. So what about the adults we currently have? Who's got agency here? Anyone? Or are you all just doing a little dance until we die? Hans Frank, who was the guy who ran Occupied Poland for the Nazis. Nasty piece of work. One of Hans Frank's kids, I think, became okay. <laughs> and then wrote okay. like a you know, big scathing book about his dad or whatever. And you get, you know, your Tony Ben. Uh, but again, that, that that's not because, outliers, that's isn't it? because that but the Tony Ben children's thing aren't aren't really an outlier. They just have a more dominant Tony Ben and then Hillary raised ben. his children. Hillary Ben reset. <laughs> well I yeah, Tony Ben himself. I thought you meant Tony Ben's children going against Tony Ben's general politics and outlook. But you mean Tony Ben Tony being an ben outlier. Ben is an He's, outlier. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> but I think that's just because like Tony Ben like everyone didn't invent any ideas no yeah 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 he must just have had some kind of environmental influence that was greater than those his parents mm -hmm. could put him in mm -hmm. and the reason it reset in his next generation is because those children then had a different dominant environmental mm. ideology being placed on them i don't this structure agency thing what agency where is their agency? <laughs> when did we have agency? When did this come in? <laughs> agency? Yeah. Chance would be a fine thing. <laughs> I fucking love going hard, hard structuralism where kind of, even if you just reduce it to its chemical or even like particulate level, there's like this inevitability to everything. Oh yeah. Do you know about Laplace's demon? Please tell me about Laplace's so demon. So Laplace... Uh, French philosopher or scientist from mm. uh, 200 years ago. Huge margin of error because I've made that number up. Um, <laughs> the olden days. Not quite the olden <laughs> days. Modern but long ago. He came up with the idea that if there was a demon that yeah. knew the position of everything and the momentum of everything, that where everything was yeah. travelling, right? Yeah. Of everything down to the smallest unit you could possibly think of, that demon would have complete full knowledge of the future stretching to infinity if you know where everything is and you know what everything's about to do like the motion it's going to do or whatever chemical state it's in you will know everything completely stretching out to the future and that's not talking about where this ball's going to land or when this tree's going to wilt it's it's talking about when is like johnny from down the road what they're going to have for dinner on thursday how they're going to vote mm -hmm. in 20 years mm -hmm. what everything that happens now is a knock-on from what oh, has previous, just happened. Yeah, 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 of course. Of course it e is. Everything in the future is only going to go one way, and that is determined now. Yeah, 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 Our yeah, major yeah. issue as very <laughs> restricted beings uh -huh. with consciences, really, that were built to kick rabbits and eat them, <laughs> is that we cannot extend our mind into all those permutations. We simply, the future to us feels random. The difficulty with that is that it, we cannot conceive of ourselves outside of having free and mm. unblemished mm. free will, which allow us to make decisions unencumbered as like computer ghosts that live inside our head that can't be affected by anyone else. And this myth is one of the <laughs> wrongest we ever got it. <laughs> <laughs> it's so fucked how just how determined your thoughts and decisions are. It's like you end up getting back into the old um, sort of religious predestination arguments hmm. about about like, well, if if God is an all-knowing being, which is kind of this guy's demon, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, is an all-knowing being that knows everything that's going to happen. But God, the, the reason there can be heaven or hell uh, in Christian theology is because you have free will. But how because can God know everything will. that's going to happen? Because yeah. if there wasn't free will, then your, then your punishment or reward would neither would be just because... You're, you're just, you're just a, you're on a, a marionette path. that God is... Tr if someone stabs you, God made them stab you because everyone, yeah, 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 no yeah. one has free will. God made the universe. He flicks the first domino. And so everything that happens after that, God set up. So if I get stabbed on the street, God did it. But even if you take God's creation out of it and you just go have God's knowledge, 
and you just say God mm. knows what's going to happen, didn't necessarily cause it. You, st you still don't have free will, regardless of God creating it or not, because the knowledge of this one, um, this one inevitable path mm. negates free will. But then <laughs> it's fucking, it's just frightening. I, I love it. I love that shit. That's uh, that's sci-fi's fuck. There's so many elements to it as well. There's not this. There's like little interactions you had with people, buses you missed, and then you know people think um, sometimes think like chaos theory is like in opposition to this shit. Oh, you can't predict anything, and it's like, well, no, no, reality's chaotic and predetermined. It's chaotic to you because you're not the demon or god or whatever. But that doesn't mean it's not. You know, like when someone goes like, oh, a butterfly could flap its wing here and it could have these unknown effects there. It's like, well. Yeah, you don't know those effects. That butterfly came out of this caterpillar that came out of, you know, line going back near infinity. That was all going to happen. It appears as chaos to us, but it's not. <laughs> and as well, like, we're talking about, like, we're talking about weather systems or our inability to predict them. And, and we never will fully, probably, because they're just completely outside of our capacity now. Well, the weather's always, weather predictions are always slightly wrong. We cannot even accurately predict like the heat of the sun from one day yeah. to the next. Here's a here's a, it's a sidebar weather piece of information that I only learned recently because I'm a fucking idiot. You know where it says twenty percent like chance of rain mm -hmm. on a on a weather thing. That means that twenty percent of the area it's looking at will definitely have rain. Oh, did you just learn that now? I've just learned that yeah, now. Yeah, okay, I, great. That's made that's me because feel better. that's not intuitive. That's not an no, intuitive no, no. way of reading that no. information. Mm -mm. It's weird that twenty percent of the area will definitely have rain. Why not just list the areas that will definitely have rain? Why give Tell me this me strange rounding Tell up? Tell me about it. Just put a just put a drop on the bits that will definitely. But have they don't it. know. But this is the thing: they don't know where that twenty percent is going to be precisely. They just know twenty percent of this bit. And does that mean uh, twenty percent at any given time over an hour? Because clouds move. Again, yeah. It's so not the not rain won't be static. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Which just comes uh, back to the thing: it's totally fucked borderline unusable information but then the inner world the inner world of like so you know there's all the complexity of you know like the, the human mind and your thoughts and your consciousness and subconsciousness and everything that's going on there but then the effect of that of like you know like they they increasingly people refer to like your gut biome as well as like a kind of second brain like material like you know food that is in you can condition your thoughts as well as obviously your physical health but your um mental health can have a link to what and how you've been consuming so like you know i mean we're talking a lot about the complete <laughs> manifold complexity of reality like, and the unpredictability yeah, 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 yeah. of all the variables but nevertheless <laughs> if you have a child mm. and everyone around you supports arsenal that child is going to support <laughs> arsenal it's not that some things aren't that complicated right yeah exactly well and where, if it, if it, where it, did you come up with supporting arsenal oh i just had yeah. a i went on like a, <laughs> uh, a retreat to find myself and support arsenal came to me no you just <laughs> my mom supports arsenal my dad supports arsenal my friends at school support arsenal i support arsenal it's not that complicated in a lot of situations i would like it if people had to go on a kind of vision quest into the woods to find out what team to support or what what fucking anything what their favorite video game should be i mean why not do you know yeah. like when the amish send people outside of the amish community and yeah. that's like um i think it's something to do with like becoming an adult like you uh, have to have seen uh, what the other half of the world is like and then consciously reject it i yes. think that's sick what a sick idea yeah, that's, that's go and see good, how yeah. things yeah, could yeah. have been and consciously decide if you want that or not we don't really do that we do like my dad do this my mum do this on this but then even even when you're going out as an Amish, you've already been Amish for a bit. So like Oh, so you're conditioned yeah, to accept yeah, yeah. it. Yeah, you're conditioned yeah, yeah, exactly. to accept it. Yeah. <laughs> but it feels a lot feels... better, right? I accepted yeah, 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 it consciously, yeah, yeah. even though every aspect of my life has conditioned me to think that Amish life is in some way spiritually <laughs> superior. But isn't it strange that the people who live outside the Amish community are Did defecting you... into it? <laughs> Don't think too much about that. Like everyone argues structure agency. I do, mm. I, I do genuinely think, what agency? Where's yeah. that come from? <laughs> And it's agree. nice to think about I fully and agree. you have to see you have to behave as though you don't think that right because you have to see oh, people as free individuals to. yes yeah, otherwise yeah, yeah, yeah. you will do what evil you'll be the evil programmed robot now yeah 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 yeah. it's like a super mega level of um like objectivity where like one of the fundamental things you have to get is that well you're not going to achieve objectivity but that doesn't mean you just go well fuck it fuck it then yeah. you know, one place i think it has value is thinking about like punishment retribution and forgiveness mm. Mm. which is if someone does like it's like someone at school 
there's always like a troubled kid. Oh, you tell me about it. And that. they are vile. Yes. <laughs> yeah, 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 I, yeah. I, I've been to different schools and there's always like at least one kid that is terribly troubled. And then later mm-hmm. when you're older, you find out there's some terrible thing that happened to mm-hmm. him. Mm-hmm. There's some terrible reason why he is who he is. And everyone has always got reasons for why they're doing what they're mm-hmm. doing. Everyone is motivated by something. No one has just, like, it's like, it's not the medieval conception of evil where Satan just comes and whispers in your ear, are they? Yeah, like, they're not something has or happened bears. And they a are responding happened, yeah. to that something. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah, trapped yeah. in the middle of a Newton's cradle like the rest of you. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. rather than try to get some kind of retribution, mm-hmm. because what is that doing for anyone? That's just to, like, salve you and then mm. that extreme person's now had a other thing happen to them that that might make them just go and do the thing again yeah you just need to focus on how to get this thing not to happen again if you think the, the crime was bad or the mm. action was bad mm-hmm. you'd really just have to focus on how to not have that happen again exactly. rather than fixate on this idea of like some sort of it is just and virtuous just to harm them in some way yeah it's just mechanized it's, it's just institutionalized revenge and I think people are getting that way mm. in terms of like, I think there's broad support for prisons being more rehabilitative. Mm. But I think the concept of revenge as some kind of useful thing or some intuitive thing is still heckin' strong. Oh man, look at the amount of films that premised upon that. The John Wick movies. <laughs> yeah, loads of movies dog. about revenge. Loads of movies about revenge. But that's, it, that's I think, um, part of why going all the way back to the the heroes thing part of why we think about these like individual heroes is because there's something in terms of accessibility of understanding and stories with individuals and like individuals operating on like in how individuals relate to each other and like emotional storytelling that is very different to having a big structural explanation of a thing you know i know you get works of fiction like especially fantasy and sci-fi where a lot of the book will be devoted to explaining systems that Mm. exist in this world or whatever but the vast majority of fiction focuses on characters and also characters like inner worlds and stuff and then the popularity of that and also perhaps as a consequence of the popularity of that that bleeds into how we understand the real world in terms of like Mm -hmm. individual actions and I think this is all intertwined, right? It's not mm. like our fiction reflects this because yes. everything reflects this. Yes. Everything reflects the idea of there being some kind of great person. Yeah. And this idea of great people is only there as a superstructure to justify hierarchy. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so in a world that never had hierarchy, which is a million miles from our own, maybe there's going to be some wonderful books and wonderful TV shows which are actually about structures. <laughs> <laughs> and are perfectly coherent and pleasant to watch. I can't conceive of them, no, but I yeah. can't really conceive of a flat hierarchical Earth. So let's not let's not base what's possible on what my brain can do. I'm struggling to learn beginner's chess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, have you read The Dispossessed? By On my list. Do you know what I'm reading <laughs> instead of that? I've started reading um, Rory Stewart's 2008 book <laughs> where he walks across North Afghanistan. Why? Why? <laughs> well, obviously, loads of things are happening in Afghanistan right now. Um, I thought, wouldn't it be funny to learn a lot more about Afghanistan, but from the worst source I can imagine? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, love it. He is recounting the journey made by like a South Asian prince called Babur in mm. the 15th century, and he's decided just to walk across uh, northern Afghanistan on foot on his own. He comes across as mad, but also he kind of wants to come across as mad. He kind of wants to be this, like, you know, he's like a history professor. Mm. And so he wants to be like this. I think he's portraying himself as this dotty, but nevertheless fearless anthropologist who's just making his way through the world, trying to learn through this war-torn country. And I hate it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I really don't like it. You don't like Rory Stewart, the Tories book. And it's really interesting watching him walking around talking to like blacksmiths in war-torn Afghanistan and seeing that completely echoed in this London mayoral campaign where he spoke to shopkeepers like he was in some sort of exotic far-flung land. (laughs) What do you do? I just work at a corner shop. Oh, fascinating. And what are these? 
Oh, we What's call it? those crisps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly on the same page. Uh, can you conceive of a situation where you would befriend Rory Stewart if you're hanging out with him? I think I'm generally conflict avoidant and seek to be comfortable in my environment. So I would... Yeah. Do you know there are times friendship where... friendship though, is it? <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've lowered the bar for friendship incredibly low. <laughs> Friends, yeah, I've got loads of them. Yeah. Yes, people, like people I'm not currently in conflict with. Yeah. <laughs> I've got loads of friends. Okay, so what's the bar for friends then? It means like I will talk to him recreationally of my own volition. Yeah, that's a fair enough criteria. I think it's we, not we, we think most defining friend sound. would be a big job. I, I could imagine becoming friends with him for selfish reasons. Mm. Like if he had something I wanted access to. <laughs> like when I was in primary school, I didn't have a cartridge of Mario 3. And I was friends with this kid who did have Mario 3, yeah. only for access to Mario 3. And he was, mm. he used to, you know how you had to blow into those cartridges to remove yeah, the yeah, dust? Yeah, 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 yeah. He did it, he did a wet version of that. Oh. He would, he would blow into it wetly. And so I oh. remember really mm. strongly thinking, I got to get to the end of Mario 3 before he gets too much spittle mm. on, in the tech. Mm. And eventually, it's generally bad for tech. I can't think of a single piece of technology that's improved by it. But anyway, it did break. And then I realized I had no desire to continue spending any time with this boy. And yeah. that was the end of our friendship. And I could consider myself to have that kind of parasitical friendship relationship to mm. Rory Stewart. That would be it. He'd have to have some sort of wonderful toy. Imagine him blowing into a, a, a SNES game. I can't. He's too posh. I'm imagining him blowing into some kind of giant foghorn shaped like a french horn like some sort of like war beauty, yeah. horn atop okay, a yeah. cliff in some sort yeah, of yeah. lord of the rings type vista yeah and what's he what the hell is he summoning orcs uh he's signaling the start of a battle that he accidentally helped cause but is not actually participating <laughs> yeah, in or at risk but he will steal the valor yeah after, he'd after be one fight. of these lord of the rings like <laughs> sinister advisors <laughs> all right i thought you were gonna say one of these characters in lord of the rings that famously steals valor <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one of these guys was the reason I, I'm not actually an orc here, but I <laughs> I want to get treated like I'm an orc. People are scared of the orcs. <laughs> You're a fake orc. <laughs> yeah, I'm a fake orc. Sh -sh -sh, puts his visor down. Yeah, I'm a fake orc. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to eat a bit of this Hobbit? No, that sounds horrible. Why? That's We love eating Hobbit. Oh, I've got a biscuit, actually. <laughs> yeah, I've got a little vibe <laughs> Yeah, I'm an orc, but I actually have digestion issues. <laughs> Why did Sauron make us this way? <laughs> I think that you could have predicted that Rory Stewart would become a Tory politician when he was a child. When he was born, before he was born, mm -hmm. I think you could have predicted at it. At conception, yes. Yeah, at conception you've got two parents who were more or less deciding to make another Tory. When two Tories have a baby, they are deciding <laughs> to make another Tory, aren't they? They're not thinking about the ballot box at the time, but if you sat them down and going how will this affect the ballot box? They'll go, one more vote for the Conservative Party. That's what they're thinking about while they have sex. <laughs> That's the only way they can come. <laughs> <laughs> they just save it right then in case they need that extra little friss on to ensure they both reach climax. <laughs> I'm, sure his the dad, ballot box. I'm sure his dad was like a, some Imperial British Empire MI6 guy. I wouldn't be surprised. Mm. I actually don't know his like full story, but I know he like... Both managed to be reasonably high up in the military and become a professor. You don't do that without someone just giving you lots of help from somewhere. Yeah, you need lots of money and lots of email addresses. <laughs> yes, an email address for every month of the year. <laughs> you need to live such a high octane lifestyle that you don't have non burner accounts. I mean, I mean, I meant just networking other people's email addresses. But the idea that Rory Stewart is so heavily networked that he needs multiple inboxes, and he yeah, only he's got gives so many jobs. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> yeah no, I, I get. I know exactly what you mean. He'll say you're not going to give the professor email. You're not going to give the dot ac dot uk thing to the war guys. You're going to put give them the dot bomb or whatever the fuck the ministry. Dot is. bomb. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I've just signed up to the military. If you do need to get me while I'm actually out for active duty, you can get me at Paul Martin at gun. <laughs> no, Roy Stewart at gun.bomb. <laughs>
Mandatory Redistribution Party was created and produced by Sean Morley and Jack Lewis Evans. Our title theme was created by Ella Jean. If you enjoyed the show, please do consider supporting us only if you are able to at patreon.com forward slash mandatory redistribution party or by sharing this episode on social media. Thank you all for your support and for listening to the show. Hope you're okay. See you next time.